Dear listener and reader, I'm doing this presentation without an audience. Talking to a computer is boring. I thrive on feedback and I'm much more animated than a voice could project. Enjoy, whether you be technician, biblical studies expert, or just an interested party. In this volume, Seeing the Psalter, I have translated and presented the 150 Psalms in a format that helps the reader to see these poems in new ways. There's a database behind everything that I've done. This is managed by the GX Leaf software of Anthony Macaulay Associates. I must also acknowledge the University of Victoria Centre for Study uh, in Religion and Society, where I've had nearly three years now to interact with specialists in all sorts of fields. These colleagues have given me insight into uncounted subjects and their relationships to the religions of the world. I have examined and presented in Seeing the Psalter internal and external patterns of word usage. Some of these patterns were deliberate by the poet, and the reader will imagine the insight as communication with an ancient mind. Some, I think, were deliberate by those who collected the poems, and we can imagine the activity of these editors. Some, perhaps, are not subject to human consciousness without access to a database, but they are there and perhaps were seen by the ancients through their own extensive memorization of the whole body of the Psalter. I have divided this presentation into six sections. First, I will explore three methods for seeing what is in the body of text. I will look at several examples. I will also look at larger structures in the Psalter. I will briefly consider the music inherent in the signs in the text itself. Then I have a very brief summary on why the study of the Psalter is a worthwhile activity. And finally, there is an additional section on the technical aspects of the project. One might ask immediately, how can one see poetry? Surely we're meant to hear it. Surely it's in the performance. But there are so many possible performances and so many selections and sequences. How will we learn to hear them in our visual culture? With the techniques that I will illustrate, we will find it easier both to hear and to see this poetry. And we will discover that to see is to begin to hear. Now, it is poetry. It is unfortunately true in our very fast-moving society that poetry can be intimidating. We need to slow down. That is why I have deliberately chosen to translate largely without punctuation, so that the reader must take time to form the phrases into thoughts. I have three principles for seeing, or insight. The first is called parallelism. It is a principle written about by Robert Loth, an 18th century scholar. One can think of it as a form of rhyming ideas. Its formal name is Parallelismus Membrorum. The second is called Prosody. It answers the question of how can we arrange the text so that we can see these pieces of the text, these phrases or members. It is difficult to perceive the form in the poem if it is just a block of text. Prosody is the art of displaying poetry. A starting point in Hebrew poetry is to see the lines of a psalm in twos and threes, and sometimes fours. Poetry is also defined as singing to speech by the 1906 Jewish Encyclopedia. We will consider the music briefly later. The third principle is recurrence, the repetition of words sharing a common root. These words have shared consonants that make them sound alike. They are the assonance, a part of the technique that ties the poem together. Recurrence is also a relatively objective observation.
distinguish between parallelism and recurrence. Parallelism is the expression of the same or an antithetical thought in different words. Recurrence is the repetition of the same word in the poem. This distinction removes some subjectivity from initial structural considerations. We will usually agree when two words have the same root letters. We may not agree that two concepts with words having different letters express or represent a similar or contrasting thought. On this slide, there are two examples from Psalm 18. First, verse 21, the Lord will reward me for my righteousness. For the purity of my hands, he will turn to me. In this case, the form is A, B, B, A, a form frequently called a chiasm. You can see the shape of the chi letter in the color coding. Look at Psalm 1822. For I have kept the ways of, of the Lord, and I have not been wicked with my God. In this case, the form is A, B, A, B. Now, in order to hear or see this in translation, the translator has to be very careful. You can see that these verses in Hebrew have the ABBA form and the ABAB form. Look at the word count. In each case in Hebrew, the thought is expressed in a very few words, two, three, or four. Translations into languages like English have more words than the Hebrew. Hebrew is a language that uses affixes, letters before and after the root word, and sometimes in the middle, that express tense, mood, aspect, prepositions, and pronouns. You can see how easy the words are to count. The underlines show the roots. Recurrence is the repeated use of words from the same root. Recurrence is the main subject of the book, Seeing the Psalter. Rabbi Magane instructs us to read with a colored pencil, or at least a pencil. And he says, circle the words that repeat. Are these words in sequence or in reverse usage? Or are they a spine or a focus for the poem? Then pay attention to what is in the middle, what is surrounded by the recurring words. Psalm 18, 21 to 22 is itself part of a section. And here is the section from verses 20 to 25 laid out for ease of reading in both languages. What do we see here? Because of the principle of two or three, it's already better than a block of text or longer lines. But look at what the recurrence pattern is on the next page. Notice the overall arrowhead pattern. This is created by the recurring words, the way they're laid out in the table. Where there is such an arrowhead shape, if you drew circles joining the words in the text, you would find that the circles are concentric. So look in the middle to see what they surround. Here I have laid out some of the key words, and in color some of the words that are surrounded by the concentric circles that they form. All his judgments and his statutes are circled by four circles. These concentric circles are formed by joining the words that recur in reverse sequence. My righteousness, turn, kept, not, and their reverse. These all surround all his judgments and his statutes. And three of them surround the confident hope that I am complete in him. Note also the last recurring word, before, a focus of the passage. There is a face-to-face -face relationship portrayed here. His judgments and his statutes are before me, and the purity of my hands 
is before his eyes. Here is a second quite different example. Psalm 137, the last reminder in Psalter of the exile, has three different voices remembering. First person plural in the first section, when we remember Zion. First person singular in the second section, if I do not remember you. And second person singular imperative in the third section, remember. Lord of the children of Eden. And notice the famous verse of smashing the children. Incidentally, that word smash, usually omitted when reciting this psalm, occurs only twice in the Psalter, here and in the smashed pots of Psalm 2. These wider patterns are explored in the book also, and we'll see something of them later. The result is a storied coherence to the Psalter. Here is yet another example of a different sort of pattern. In this case, a host of 43 k sounds in the poem. In English, the sounds are you, your, the final singular second person pronoun ka, and kol, the Hebrew for all, every, emphasized here almost as a drumbeat. Psalm 145 is the final alphabetic acrostic. Here is a pattern that shows across two psalms. There are in fact several patterns that tie consecutive psalms together, but this one is a wide structure between Psalm 2 and 149. Both of these patterns look deliberate. Verses 2b of Psalm 149 uses only words from Psalm 2. Verses 7 to 9 use six words from Psalm 2 in sequence, one word in each of its six lines. When Psalm 2 and 149 are compared in the database, the resulting intertextual illusion is quite clear as the table shows. So we need to consider that the whole Psalter itself appears to be in an envelope. There are other clues that will reinforce this thesis, and we will see some of them shortly. Now we can summarize these three tools using Psalm 1.1. Parallelism, prosody, and recurrence. You can see the parallelism in the English. We have a person who does not walk in the advice of the wicked, and in the way of sinners does not stand, and in the seat of the scornful does not sit. It's A, B, B, A, B, A. It's also a three by three structure, and it has three repeating knots in it. So we see that structure, all three tools very clearly. They're like three gardening tools. Now briefly, let's look at larger structures in the Psalter. We have already hinted that these are observable. On the surface, we have 150 poems in five books. Each book is marked with a short closing doxology. The example is given from Psalm 41.14, the last verse of Book 1. The books are also arranged in a sandwich structure. We'll see that on the next slide, in the next two slides. There's also an overall structure that is curiously managed by the acrostics. Here's the surface structure. And I'm grateful to Anthony Macaulay Associates for the diagramming surface that is a part of GX Leaf. This is a ridiculously complex view of the Psalter. I did dozens of others until I began to see the whole using the acrostics. The sandwich structure. Books 2 and most of Book 3 to Psalm 86 are called the Eloist Psalter. 
The software that I'm using also supports queries, dashboards, and other drill down and present presentation tools in its interactive development environment. This particular graph was written to ask how are the divine name and the words for God used in the Psalter? The result is a remarkable sandwich. The Lord, or Adonai, Hashem, yod He vav He, as bread, and Elohim as the meat in Psalms 42 to 86. If we look at the overall structure of the Psalter, we see that it has several envelopes. Book one is mostly of David. In fact, all the inscriptions are of David except four of the Psalms. Two of them are Psalms one and two. Um, and then Psalm 33, a rather special Psalm, has no inscription. And Psalm 10 has no inscription, but it's really a single Psalm with Psalm nine. Book five ends with David. Books two and three are organized in a, a series of concentric circles, Psalms of Korah, then Asaph, then Psalms of David, followed by a central section on harvest, Psalms 66 and 67, followed by Psalms of David, then Asaph and Korah, in reverse order to what we had, and then a couple of extra Psalms. Book four is a unit almost of itself, uh, a response uh, organized around the name of Moses. There's also a prayer of Moses at Psalm 90 and an answering prayer in Psalm 102, surrounded by Psalms of David. Book one, like book five, organize themselves around the acrostics. And we've already seen the opening and closing Psalm 2 and Psalm 149. Now let's look at these acrostics, these eight acrostics. They occur only in books one and five, four in each. All the acrostics in book one are defective. These are Psalms 9 and 10 together, then Psalm 25, 34, and 37. All the acrostics in Book 5 are perfect. There are no letters missing. These are Psalms 111 and 112, then 119, 22, eight verse poems in that psalm, and 145, the last psalm before the final praises. If we look at the poems just prior to each acrostic, it appears that each acrostic follows and celebrates a psalm of significance. So in this we highlight Psalm 8, 24, 33 and 36 in Book 1, and in Book 5, Psalm 110, 118 and 144, seven psalms all together. There is a chiasm connecting the first and last psalms in this set. Psalm 8 contains the phrase, what is a mortal, and the word fingers, ma enosh. Psalm 36 is an oracle, na'um. Psalm 110 is an oracle, na'um. And Psalm 144 mimics Psalm 8. What is this humanity, ma adam? And it includes the only other mention of fingers in the Psalter. This diagram shows the relationship between these poems. That there are four acrostics in each of Books 1 and Book 5, and that one of them is quite special, being an eightfold acrostic, and that there are four acrostics in the Book of the Lamentations of Jeremiah, and the Chapter 3 in that book is quite special, being a threefold acrostic. This suggests that these poems in the Psalter reveal a very high level organization centered around the exile. The Psalms tell the full canonical story 
of Israel and Judah. Finally, I would like to have a brief look at the music. The text contains signs that for the last thousand years have been considered punctuation. It's a very difficult concept to consider this punctuation. In the past century, Suzanne Haig Ventura tested by experimentation a musical mapping based on the idea that the signs are hand signals or chironomy, an ancient sign language for conductors. She has achieved a remarkable deciphering key. There's not a lot of agreement with her theory in the field, but the results of the performances are absolutely beautiful. I have mapped her deciphering key. Notice the decimal notation before below the notes showing what's required for extended HTML if you want to show these letters with the signs. Here's an example of the really shows the is a so we conclude with why study the Psalter to be a part of this song and conversation to learn Chesed, Covenant Mercy to form the Hasidim, a world, a community, that has learned such kindness. The book, Seeing the Psalter, was produced under the control of GX LEAF. The LEAF stands for Live Enterprise Accountability Framework. It's a general purpose web-based development platform that allows very quick creation of data tables and web forms by a qualified user. GXLEAF is built and supported by Anthony Macaulay Associates. It is used worldwide for the management of complex programs. It has a design surface based on a diagramming paradigm, allowing very easy construction of the desired components of a system. Among those who've benefited from its economic rapid application development are the women's programs at the United Nations and in Canada, the Federal Department of Health. GX Leaf allowed for me the creation of three major components of a system to control the translation process. The first part is just that, a control system. Careful control is the primary need. Several aspects of the data, gloss, root, text, notes, must support memory and be under the translator's control. Secondly, there's an experimental capacity. One needs to test hunches against the data. One needs filters and the ability to manipulate them creatively and even define additional ones. One needs time to explore. The whole is very complex and foreign. Third, GXLEAF provides a presentation capacity. How else would a report of results emerge? Essentially, seeing the Psalter is a report of my investigations and experiments over the last six years. Here is a slide on controlling the translation process. The critical aspects of controlling the translation are all present on this form. We can select a chapter and verse we can closely compare aspects of the translation. We can do queries by gloss, queries by root form or stem. 
and there is a history of changes. Even the database structure can be inferred from this slide. If you look at the top, you'll see the content, the English and the Hebrew verse by verse, in a textual form. There's a query result on the left-hand side for the request for book and chapter, in this case, Psalms 117. This can work with a single verse at a time or a group of verses. 117 verse 1 is highlighted, and the word clans is highlighted. This reveals a second database containing stem, gloss, lexical word by chapter and verse. The column POS in indicates the position of the gloss in the translated text. A zero in that position is sometimes important to verify, hence the filter for not in verse prompt. The verses sharing the selected item are shown in the middle query. Also on the left is a search for prompt, and the result of this search is just below uh, under the title search string in gloss. The upper right corner allows close comparison between two verses, very useful for psalms that are similar to each other or verses that are identical, and you want to see how perhaps, whether there are any slight differences in spelling and so on. The filters are under the control of the translator. In this case, 1146 records had been changed in the previous 300 days. And the verses are listed with their change date. In the lower left, under remaining queries, is a list of words that represent possible compromises of the rules for assigning an English gloss that I followed when translating. Below that is the set of recent changes for the currently selected chapter and verse. These date range queries reveal that a full audit mechanism on the database tables is available. on to the second major need, the need to explore and experiment. This exploration, experimentation, and our next major need presentation are all overlapping. Uh, the translator requires timely feedback in all three areas. The particular chart in view here gives an example both of a query and of the parameters implicit in its definition. All these cases are under the user's control. In this case, for the Book of Psalms, it shows the relationship of Psalm 117 to each of the other psalms in the Psalter. Then a separate query page can be used to see just what words are shared and whether there are significant things to draw from this exercise. Psalm 117 is two short verses containing the word praise. Uh, the whole poem is a mere 17 words in length. If you look at Psalm 136 in the graph, it shares 40% of the words with Psalm 117. And note Psalm 150 at the right-hand side. It shares 45% of the words. In this case, it is somewhat easy to guess that these two psalms would be most strongly related to Psalm 117. Psalm 136 is one of two poems celebrating the arrival in the courts of the Lord after the Psalms of the Ascents, and Psalm 150 is the final praise in the Psalter. Getting the data out of the database is likewise managed by a set of queries and filters. This allows display of the book, the chapter, the translation, and the tables filtered by various criteria. I also had all my initial notes, notes by verse and notes by chapter in the database. Several filters control the table of recurring words. This table is a crosstab of a hidden query designed by the qualified user. The first stage constructs a table meeting the selection criteria. 
The result is manipulated by a crosstab algorithm using these keywords and the corresponding filters. Getting data into the database requires a lot of work. Typing, translation, manipulation, running an algorithm to discover the root, correcting the roots to what you really want them to, to say, running an algorithm to calculate the color of the table elements for display, and so on. I wrote all these algorithms gradually over a period of more well, seven or eight years as I used the data uh, as a testing ground for the GX Leaf software. What I did not have to do is equally important. I began with a multi-user, highly secure web infrastructure, Unicode ready, easy to build forms. All these were available for me to use and test through the GX Leaf interface. This tool has also been applied to other situations in rhetorical analysis. Uh, it has many, many possible applications.